Hey everyone, welcome to day one of the photography show uh, of our two two day event. We hope you've uh, been able to check out loads of great stuff that we've already had on today. Um, if you're joining us today, then that probably means that you are interested in remote shooting. Hello everyone. Um, as Alistair said, I'm going to be talking to you today about remote shoots. I've been doing remote shoots worldwide. Um, so I'll talk you through a little bit about me first of all, and then I'll take you through the technology, the um, how it all got started, and then towards the end I will do a demonstration so you can see a remote shoot actually um, how it all happens, how it sets up and how we do it. So um, I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen. So I, um, I was playing around with those ideas and then I saw a casting online, a photographer was also thinking along the same lines, but also hadn't worked it out yet. So, but I immediately got in touch because I thought, okay, you know, I, I do need a photographer to be able to test this out with. So now that I had someone else on board, I then spent the weekend in the studio, testing out tethered shooting, um, tethering the camera to the laptop and then realizing that if I connected with somebody via Zoom and gave them remote access, they could control the tethered uh, software on my screen and work it like that. So um, it was a, a lot of troubleshooting going on that weekend, but we set the first remote shoot to happen on the 1st of April which um, once we had announced it on Facebook, this being a new concept, people thought was an April Fool's joke. But um, we managed to do this shoot, which was really quite remarkable. It felt quite groundbreaking at the time. Um, and Gary in Huddersfield, was in Huddersfield in his home, taking photographs of me in my studio in Leeds. And these were the images that we captured that day. Now, at the time, with the camera that I had, um, we were having trouble syncing a few lights, so we worked with one light only. But now that I knew that this could work, I then was able to tweak uh, and upgrade equipment to really um, suit remote shoots to be um, smooth, fast, reliable, um, and this is the technology, the, this is all the equipment that I use. So I'm using a Canon 5D Mark IV camera. So I'm getting really good sharp images with this camera. Now before remote shoots, I used to favour prime lenses, but for the remote shoots, I decided that you know to have a zoom lens was going to make it more convenient because of having to switch lenses several times through the shoot. So my go-to lenses are the Canon 85 millimeter for um, portraits. And then I tend to switch to the 2470 because it suits um, shooting three quarters to full length and we can make those adjustments quick, quickly and easily. Um, now, I use a, an SD card, I, the fastest that I could find. Now, the remote shoots are really quite dependent on, you know, making everything run smoothly. So I use the fastest SD card because we're transferring a lot of data from, um, from the camera also to the laptop. So the fastest I could find was 300 megapixels per second. Uh, which I also have to use the um, coinciding um, card reader to transfer the images. The same with uh, when the images, every time we take a shot, we're saving three files, a raw file and a JPEG to the memory card and sending a JPEG to the laptop so that we can view the images instantly. So I save those images on a, an external hard drive, which is a Samsung T7, uh, two terabyte, but it's also uh, doing it at high speeds. Um, the 
the cable that I use to, to connect the laptop and the camera is from Tether Tools. It's a five meter cable allowing flexibility in the studio so I can move the camera around without um, disconnecting. Um, and Tether Tools are known for their uh, reliability and fast data transfer. I have a webcam, a uh, 4K webcam, and that's so that the photographer can see around the studio. So they can see everything that's happening. They can see the position of the lights. They can see where I am um, as, as alongside the live view of the camera. I have two speakers and microphones, one at the desk where um, I will be talking to the photographer and one further back in the studio where I'm most likely to be posing. The tethering software that I use is the one that comes with Canon. Um, it's the EOS Utilities software. Um, it works, works perfectly, it shows the live view, it's got all the camera settings available and um, a quick preview as well. And the video conferencing that I use is Zoom. So right from the very start, Zoom became very popular and I found it consistently um, reliable. So this is a snapshot of my setup. So uh, you can see on the top monitor, it's a BenQ monitor, what's there is how, what a photographer sees and what they're, they're controlling the camera, that they can see the live view, they can see images. You'll see this more clearly later when we uh, do the demo. But on, on my desk there, I've got, I use two batteries in the camera. So I've got a dual battery charger and that's just so that I'm not running out of charge during a photo shoot. Generally speaking, my photo shoots are three hours, so um, I don't have to switch um, batteries. The speaker and microphone uh, that I said, I have two of those. Um, but they're actually designed for conference meetings. So it's just so that wherever I am in the studio, I can be heard clearly and I can hear the photographer as well. Um, my MacBook Pro and the webcam, you can see there, and the only thing missing, I think, is my rich tea biscuits that I like to snack on during my shoots. Um, what else have we got? So this is just um, what you can see where the camera's on the tripod and the long cable. Uh, other things that I have is, these are all things that I've upgraded since the, the very start. So I have a field monitor right next to the camera so that I can see um, my framing in the camera. So when a photographer is directing me one way or the other, I can see quite clearly what they're expecting of me. And um, the, the shot on the right is just showing how I have the cable in the port. So I'm using a tether tools uh, block to support the cable. And the reason why is because I'm shooting quite often tethered and the cable is quite heavy so I'm protecting the port from the weight of the cable uh, by securing it like that. So reasons to shoot remotely, so I've done now maybe 150 or, or more remote shoots with people all over locally around England, um, all around the UK, Europe, and worldwide. And so I have learned from so many people the different reasons that they've taken up remote shoots. The most obvious is because we're, we've been in lockdown and the social distancing. So people, this had been a way for people to continue doing photo shoots. But it's also opened up the opportunities to work with people that are abroad, um, that we might not otherwise have had the chance to get together. Um, I've worked with people it, all over the USA, uh, Thailand, um, Germany, Switzerland, Slovenia, and then as far down south 
uh, Cornwall and way up north, Ireland, Wales, everywhere. Uh, also for portfolio building, people still like to continue adding images to their portfolios, their websites, and uh, keeping up with that creativity. And, you know, a lot of online learning became a thing. So people still book me for one-to-one -one tuition uh, via Zoom. And it's just another way of staying active, you know, whilst people, some people haven't been able to continue working or, or getting out and about. So they're at home and able to stay active. Also with mental health and disabilities, I know that um, I've worked with many people that are wheelchair bound or people that um, have found that planning, having the something to look forward to, the planning, it's been motivating, giving them extra support, it lifts their mood. Um, so, you know, allowing that creativity has been really useful to people's mental health issues. And also entering competitions. So many people, you know, the, comp the photography competitions have still been happening. Some people like to enter annually and so, you know, they've not needed to miss out on that by doing the remote shoots, they're still able to take part in competitions. And also for, um, for people's income, uh, shooting book covers, for shooting for stock libraries, shooting for designers. Um, so it's been able to support some people's um, income still. So I'm just going to show you what has been achieved during remote shoots um, there are no limits as far as what's available in a studio environment so working with gel lighting here um, was a mood board that a photographer sent to me now i didn't very often shoot natural light in this studio because i have one window and it's really set up with um, uh, as a studio uh, lighting um, place so when photographers started wanting to shoot natural light, I was able to move towards the window and, you know, just rotate everything and shoot natural light. We've been playing around with uh, projected images in photography and also um, shooting portraits and shooting fashion and also shooting for magazine articles and newspapers. This shot was for um, Photo Plus, the Canon magazine. And I'm just going to keep on taking you through some images so that you can see what the possibilities are. So these were taken by a photographer in Ireland called Paul Cooley. Um, Ricky Singh took these, he was based in Manchester. Um, this was a lady from a camera club that I had done a talk at, um, Linda. Now, Colin Nash in Worcester. Alistair Currell. Cheltenham, Mark Edmondson in Preston. So many portraits. So I have Mark Edmondson in Preston again and um, John Carter in Shanghai. Chris Cathern in Thailand. And this photographer was in Washington and wanted to shoot something in a film noir style. This was Ricky Singh in Manchester again. And here I just want to show you that this is the, the range that can be achieved during one remote shoot. So um, this particular photographer wanted to shoot portraits for a variety of competitions that were coming up in her camera club. So we wanted to create varying styles, nothing too similar to one another and using different lighting. So all of these were done during one remote shoot. So I did a second shoot with Gary Brown in Huddersfield uh, recently. So 
Um, people see what's, I'm constantly adding images to my portfolio and it kind of helps people to choose the sort of styles that they'd like to, to shoot. These were from uh, someone in Germany. Uh, the mood boards can get really detailed at times. We've been using gobos to play with shadows and light. And always props, hats, jewellery, whatever people can think of. So finally, I'm going to just take a moment to switch everything on so that Alan can take some photographs so that you can actually see everything in action. So if I just close this down. Is the screen still shared, Alistair? Um, yeah, you're, st you're still on. Um, it's probably a good opportunity for me to uh, pop up really quickly. Um, we had a question from uh, Mark Lanyon, uh, who asked, do you think that remote shoots will ultimately replace uh, modelling in person, or do you think they're just another avenue for people to explore? I, I don't think that it could possibly um, replace at all, because people get so much enjoyment out of um, uh, going into studios and meeting one another. The fact that we've been uh, restrained from that mm. doesn't mean that it will replace it. But I do, um, one of the things that I um, al always want to bust the myth of uh, not being able to have rapport when you're shooting remotely because um, even for example Alan who is going to uh, take photographs uh, for this demo we've become good friends we've connected remotely uh, for photo shoots and we uh, the directing and the taking photographs and talking and just chat chit chatting about life still happens remotely just the same as it would happen um, in person. So I think the two can stand by, side by side. The opportunity to be able to work with people in other countries will still be there for me. Um, or if people can't travel to me or I can't travel to them, even in this country. So, yeah. Like yeah. And I think, you know, not just in terms of photography, but it's brought, you know, it's, it's allowed people to chat a bit more. Um, yeah. I don't know if we're going to call it face to face, but screen to screen more than they probably would have done previously. Yeah, that's right. I think, um, yeah, it's really brought us together in a different way, I think. It has. Um, so. So okay. you're going to set yourself up now for um, a little remote shoot with Alan. Yes. So I'm just going to open. So I hope you're seeing what I'm setting up. I'm just going to open one more folder yeah we're seeing that yeah so get that in gallery view so i'll just tell you what's here so this is eos utilities that i have open it's the tethering software so this here is the control panel we have the shutter button and the camera settings the shutter speed aperture and iso um, and this is the live view and when we take a photograph it will appear here and down here will be the folder that they all get stored in so i'm gonna go and pose away can you do you have access now yeah i've had the message there yeah. i can control your screen so we're good wonderful so i'll leave you guys to it thank you alistair so Was that a test shot from you? No, oh, well, it wasn't. If it was, it wasn't intentional. <laughs> okay. So. 
Yeah, that, yeah Alan, just um, yeah. As, as you kind of work through the motions here, if you could just um, tell us what you're kind of, yeah, I will. what you're up to. So you can see these two boxes, the, the, the central boxes where it's really aiming to focus. The other one is an area which, um, which just gives you some confidence. You can you can zoom into this to get a really fine focus, but we won't bother doing that because most people don't bother, and it's mainly unnecessary with with, with this sort of aperture and shutter speed. So I'm just about to take a shot, Natasha. So three, two, one, and again. Oh, you got me on a blinker. Uh, I'll be good. Oh yeah, no, I, I, and I did too. So let me just open the folder at the bottom, and then we will take another. Yeah. So we can see that you know I I mean, I obviously you could post process that to uh, try and make it a bit better, but I would. <laughs> I think what I might do is um, from the aperture a little bit. So you can see, well, I've just gone up to 5.6, 5, 5. that'll be good. Move in the focal point. So ready, three, two, one. That looks good. A little bit closer, yep. Yeah. Take a couple more and then yeah, I'll- Yeah, why not, yep. Yeah. So we're gonna lean forward a little bit. Super. Three, two, one. Yeah, lovely. Very cool. Three, two, one. It's funny holding a smile for that long. I was <laughs> oh, just testing. Yes. So um, what I'll just go through is, um, so Alan is able to move the focus. I'll just demonstrate what he was talking about. You can zoom in and then really fine tune the focus onto the eye. There's not anything there to focus on at the moment, but those are the go, options. Do you want to go back and I'll do it quickly? And then yeah, back. sure. So I guess everybody can now see quite a large eye filling the frame there. Okay. Just go back so that we can check. That's great. Three, two, one. Oh, and I caught you again, I think. Oh, no. Let's just try one more. Perhaps. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. Shoulder forward. That's lovely. And again, just, just for the sake of demonstration, I'll move in, get the camera to focus on your eye, come back out, and three, two, one, done. Other options are also, um, there's a menu just in here that you can have auto face detect. So, then track me. So depending on what we're shooting, sometimes people want to use that. So it's just another option. But generally speaking, um, yeah, it's just one of those things that people decide from shoot to shoot how they want to go about it. There are lots of options, but um, it's down to the individual what they want to use. So, is there anything else you think, Helen, that <clears throat> um, you should do? Not really. I, I, obviously, everybody's got their own approach to doing things. Yeah. So, uh, you're yeah. trying to give people an overview of, of uh, you know, 
the simplified way of doing it. It's so flexible. It's it's really great. And uh, the ta yeah. I think the other thing is, if I can give anybody advice about doing this, it's work with an experienced model because it's hard work for the model. It, Natasha makes it sound and seem very easy. It's actually very hard work for the model, but the results can be fantastic. So what we would do periodically is just come along and have a flick through the images and see what we like, check for sharpness, we'll zoom in, make sure things are sharp and just check the shots as we go along. So, um, and decide what we want to do next. So that is it. That's the how remote shoots have been working for the past year. Come on in, Alistair. I'm coming in. <laughs> I was just reading some of the questions. Everyone seemed to really enjoy that. And it was, you know, it's just a, a great a, a demonstration of how it works. I think maybe when, when all this first came about, there was a bit of apprehension. Um, Absolutely. You know, and, and of course, a lot of people get get their enjoyment um, through photography, you know, through being there physically with somebody. Um, yeah. But, you know, you've just demonstrated there that, you know, besides being parted by um, a screen, it, it really was not all that different. Yeah. Um, and so te technical wise, obviously, you still you still get in the same quality results at the end, the same, you know, large files um so we've had a couple of people ask a couple of questions um martin possible we had a couple of questions um and he, and he said um do you do you have a set of images that you would send the photographer in advance to show your studio set up and kit um what's available what they can work with um so they can plan ahead yeah absolutely i have on my website a page uh for the studio and that has some sample images, but it also has a long list of all the equipment here. Um, so definitely, um, yeah, that, that's the, the biggest list of everything. But at the start of a shoot, I also go through a few things. I just explain what's readily available and to always ask, have you got this? If you think of anything, because I might well have it tucked away in cupboards or whatever. But then also my portfolio shows a lot of what's, what's been achieved um, in the studio. So it'll show you um, different backdrops, different setups, um, even my wardrobe, like jewelry that I've used before and things like that. So it does yeah. give people yeah. a good idea. And um, his second question was uh, a bit more of a techie one. Is there a minimum connection speed that any remote photographer would need in order not to suffer any connectivity issues? I guess he means internet. Um, I had a yeah, Wi-Fi. So um, I don't know what the minimum would be. Um, I think it's really just knowing that your Wi-Fi is consistent. Um, I know that for, for here, the, the Wi-Fi for the studio is dedicated to the studio. There's nothing else using it. And so when, if there are any issues um, <clears throat> on the photographer's Wi-Fi, it could cause a problem, but it's, it, it doesn't hinder the shoot happening. You know, yeah. if there are little variations like that, it's still possible to get good shots. Yeah, I mean, all the heavy lifting is kind of being done by your camera and your tether and, and your computer, isn't it? You know, that's dealing with yeah. big stuff. Yeah, exactly. So as, lo as long as they've got a half decent <laughs> connection and, you, you know, can yeah, with a video can... call, that's all, that's all that's needed, I would, I would assume. Absolutely. Just making sure they have a uh, mic, a microphone, um, you know, you'd be surprised, like, I don't know, some people might not have a microphone. And even in that circumstance, we've been able to uh, communicate on, on a different programme, perhaps, like through WhatsApp or something like that. Yeah, well, I think, you know, you, you've both proved here that any any uh, obstacles thrown in, in the way of creative people, uh, we'll overcome them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, just before you lo I lose you, um, I'm just going to check whether we've got anything else come in. Um, a Douglas Kerr, just, you've probably already answered it, yeah. you've done the shoot, but just says, how does another photographer 
actually control uh, your laptop? Um, it's through the shared screening. So um, once I've shared the screen, I then give remote access. There's a button in Zoom that just says give uh, remote access to Alan Williams. Um, and then they can just control the screen. Yeah. Um, oh, we've got a couple more coming in now, which is good. Because um, you're, you're kind of finished with your presentation, aren't you? So we can chat about a couple of, couple of questions. Um, Will B says, you mentioned a lot of competition and a qualification entry remote sessions. How does this sit with the ethics and rules of competitions? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that would be covered under copyright. So the, um, because the photographer taking the picture remotely owns copyright. So it's yeah. still their image in exactly the same way. Yeah. So at, yeah. the end, at the end of a shoot, I send all the raw files and the JPEGs if the JPEGs are wanted. And it's up to the photographer what they do with those images. They own those images. Yeah, that's right. That reminds me of, uh, what, what was it, the, the monkey that, that took a selfie and there was an argument over who owned it. Do you remember that one? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think he got copyright in the end. Yeah, well, if you, press, if you press the shutter, you own copyright. That's it. A um, couple more coming in, actually. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, can you change the power output of the lights or do you only have control of all of the camera's settings? You only have control of the camera settings. I'm I'm working here modeling yeah. and as your studio assistant. So if, yeah. you want, if you want the camera moved, if you want the lights changed up or down, I'm there for you. Uh, yeah, well, that sounds like a, a job for another person. <laughs> yeah, it would be great to have an assistant. We all deserve an assistant. <laughs> That's it. Well, once once we're all allowed back together, that, that could be another avenue for somebody, remote shoot assistant. Um, okay, the smoking. I'm just checking if we've got anything else here. Just people, just people complimenting you. You really just saying, you know, this is great to see it in action. Um, although we've, you know, this has obviously been tested out over quite a period of time now. I think people are still a bit skeptical. So it's it's kind of great, great to 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 see it in action. Yeah, one of the things that um, I, I often say to people that are doing a remote shoot for the first time and expressing their apprehension about it is that, you know, of course it's strange at first, but mm -hmm. as you, get, you very quickly get into a flow and then you're no longer thinking about the technical side. You are actually just focused on the shoot and what styling we're doing and the shoot at hand rather than the technical side of it so you really do just fall into it quite quickly yeah i mean just in those couple of minutes there i'd kind of forgotten that we weren't all in the same room yeah so, you know we were just doing doing this shoot and watching the images come in yeah. um, because there's so much more to think about when you, we're actually in the flow of a shoot we're thinking about how we're going to light it what we're going to style you know um, how I'm going to pose, all that sort of thing is in, in play. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, there's not, there's, there's not too much more for me to say. It's, it just, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, yeah. and it's been a great, a great way to get around the, the problems of the last year. Um, yeah. and it, and it looks like it's actually not going to go away once we're, we're all allowed back out to play anyway. It's going to be around that's for cool. a while. Yeah. Um, so Natasha, thank you. Where else? Um, where else can uh, we watch you this weekend? Do you want again? Yes, I'm doing a talk tomorrow called the Portrait Roadmap. So it's just a step by step um, into like coming up from coming up with the idea to the finished image, uh, showing you how we go about getting those sort of award winning portraiture. Right, so people should have seen this, should definitely tune into that. And there's, yeah. there's people asking um, questions here about uh, kind of how long is a shoot and how much does it cost and all that sort of thing. So if they wanted to get in touch with you, how, how can someone get in touch with you? Um, my website is uh, www.natashajbella.co.uk. Um, there's lots of information on there about the remote shoots and workshops. So please get get in touch um there's contact page get in touch with me with your inquiries i'm happy to um speak to anybody great
Oh, we just had one more come in whilst we said that uh, from Kamini. Um, ha have any photographers ever sent you specific things to shoot with remotely? Yes, absolutely. Even remotely, people have sent things in the post. Um, we've done the shoot and I've returned them if they want them back, mostly. Um, so anything from, um, I've had uh, face masks like Venetian masks and uh, parachute fabrics and jewellery and hats and all sorts. So people do, still do provide things for the shoots. This, it, this is great. I'm just, there's loads more questions coming in. Now we've started the ball rolling. Um, now I'm just going to try try to scroll back through there was quite an interesting one someone said is <coughs> is alan in hang on um does this only work if the model has their own kit or is alan just in the next room <laughs> yeah it's true in, in, in fact i'm if, if the fashion moves two foot to the left i'll yeah. pop up my head will pop up next to it <laughs> um, it does only work with um if the model has their own kit. But I know that there are other ways. I mean, um, Alan has done remote shoots with um, models using a mobile phone. Um, so most people have a mobile phone. So um, that is another way. So I happen to have a studio and the uh, camera and everything. So it gives me more options for setting up the so if I can comment, I mean, I have, I've done quite a lot of shoots with people using mobile phones and there, I've seen some fairly dire results from mobile phones and I've seen some fairly good results from mobile phones and I sort of hope mine were somewhere between dire and good. But the, the big difference is the, the, the image quality um, and the control you've got over what's going on with um, the stuff that I've done with Natasha and other models with, where where they've got a setup like Natasha's got, there, there's no comparison. You can get some great shots with mobile phones, but they're good shots. They're not the quality of image that you're going to get with the sort of setup that models like Natasha have set themselves up to do. Yeah, clutch. Yeah, Clive just said he was only joking, which um, I think we knew, but it was good, it was good to point out that you were just to the side. Um, so I think we're going to have to wrap up there. Natasha, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to Alan for popping along and helping us out. You're very welcome. Right, have a good day tomorrow. Okay, see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.